Hey coders, so I heard you like making games. Me too. <laughs> I think projects like this are great not only for aspiring game developers, but also to learn and improve HTML, CSS and JavaScript skills. In this class we will build easy animated side scroll game completely from scratch with plain vanilla JavaScript. No frameworks and no libraries. The main goal today is to learn about basic code structure, how to split responsibilities between objects that make up our game, how to make them communicate with each other effectively and how to put all of that together in an easy to understand way. This class is a part of a longer series. In each episode we build a small standalone project for beginners to learn about fundamental building blocks of game development with the JavaScript. Full series is linked in the description. In this part we will build a simple version of the game to learn the fundamentals. In the next part we will expand on each element using the things we learned across the series. Let's see how it all comes together. Games should be exciting, full of secrets and special features. I hope this series helps you to bring your creative ideas to life. If you are a beginner, it's always a good idea to make sure you understand the basics of HTML, CSS and JavaScript before jumping into projects like this. If you're interested, there's a list of good quality Udemy courses in the video description that will help you on your self-taught web development journey. For example, did you know that Cold Steel recently updated his famous bootcamp? Give it a try if you want. We will work with three files. In index.html I link my CSS stylesheet and JavaScript file. I create HTML5 canvas element with an ID of canvas1 and I put all my game assets here in this area so that we can use load event listener to wait for these assets to be fully loaded and available before we run the game. Art assets were provided by this talented artist. You can find more on their website. I will have player image, background image and enemy image here. You can download project files in the video description. In style CSS I give my body black background. I make canvas blue and I position it in the middle of my web page. I also want to hide my image elements because we will draw them with JavaScript on canvas. So player image, display none. Same goes for background image and enemy image. I want JavaScript to wait until all images are fully loaded. So I will wrap my game inside an event listener. We will listen for load event. Load event waits for all assets such as sprite sheets and images to be fully loaded before it executes code in its callback function. I will place the entire code of our game inside this anonymous callback function. In JavaScript, anonymous function usually means a function without a name. By placing all my code inside this anonymous callback function, I separate scope of my game from a global scope to make sure my custom class and variable names don't clash with any other outside code. When all the assets are fully loaded, the code inside will be executed line by line. I assign variable to my canvas element. I create context instance of built-in canvas 2D API that holds all drawing methods and properties we will need to animate our game. I set canvas width to 800 pixels and canvas height to 720 pixels. I make canvas transparent. In this class I want to make it very clear how we split responsibilities between objects and how these objects interact with each other to create a complete game. So let's just write all the building blocks we will need today. Our game will need input handler class which will apply event listeners to keyboard events and it will hold an array of all currently active keys. Player class will react to these keys as they are being pressed, drawing and updating the player. I will have a simple separate class that will handle endlessly scrolling backgrounds. We will also need a class that will generate enemies for us. We will have multiple active enemies in our game, so I will have a function called handle enemies that will be responsible for adding, animating and removing enemies from the game. I will have a utility function I call for example display status text, which will handle things like displaying score or game over message. And lastly, we will have main animation loop. This function will run 60 times per second, updating and drawing our game over and over. So that's it. Here we can see all the building blocks we need to create a complete game. I could have wrapped everything in a main game class, for example, but I'm trying to keep it clean and simple today. Input handler class will apply event listeners to the game and it will keep track of all keys that are currently pressed down. Inside constructor I created this.keys property and I set it equal to an empty array. 
The way I want to handle controls today will be a bit different from my previous courses. I want to have an array and I will be adding and removing keys from it as they are being pressed and released. That way I can keep track of multiple key presses. I will place event listener directly inside the constructor. When we create an instance of a class, all the code inside constructor is executed. Because of that, just by simply creating an instance of input handler class later, all event listeners will be automatically applied. I will have event listener for key down event. Callback function on event listener has access to this built-in event object. I will assign it a variable name, for example e, and I console log it. Now I create an instance of input handler class, which will run all the code inside constructor. So at this point, the event listener is applied. Let's test it. When I click my canvas and I press key on keyboard, I can see this event object here. It contains all different details about keyboard event that just occurred. What I care about today is this key property. It contains a string that represents name of key that was pressed. So to get that value directly, I say e.key. Now I'm getting those values as console logs. I care only about arrow keys right now, so I say if e.key is arrow down, take this.keys array from line 9 and push that value inside. I move this console log here and I will also console log this.keys. We will get an error. This.keys is undefined. JavaScript cannot find it. It's because I'm instantiating input here and the event listener is called from window object. By the time that event listener is called, JavaScript forgot that this keyword refers to this input handler object and its this.keys property. To make sure this keyword points to the correct object, I can use JavaScript bind method or I can use ES6 arrow function. Arrow functions don't bind their own this, but they inherit the one from their parent scope. This is called lexical scoping. Doing that will make sure JavaScript doesn't forget which object this keyword stands for and it will work. You can see pressing arrow down adds an entry into this.keys array. I don't want to have multiple entries for each key. Here we can see it added arrow down four times. I only want to add it if that specific key is not in the array yet. So I do second condition here and I say if this.keys index of e.key key that was pressed is equal to minus one. With arrays, if index of is equal to minus one, it means that element is not present in the array. So I'm saying if key that was pressed is arrow down and if that key is not yet inside this.keys array, only then push it into the array. Now you can see that when I press arrow down multiple times, it adds it to the array only once. Perfect. I copy this code block and I turn it into key up event. If key that was released is arrow down, I want to remove it from this.keys array. So I call splice that takes two arguments, index of element we want to remove and how many elements starting from that index we want to remove. So I find index of arrow down inside this.keys array by using index of method again. And second argument to splice, I want to remove one element at this index. So here I'm saying when we release a key, if that key is arrow down, find index of that key inside this.keys array and use splice to remove one element from that array. Now when I press down arrow key, it's added to the array. When I release it, it's removed from the array. Nice. Let's also listen for other keys using OR operator. I start with arrow up. Then we also need to listen for key down on arrow left and arrow right. I'm gonna break this down on individual lines for clarity and I use tab key to make them vertically aligned. Be careful here not to forget a bracket, otherwise the code will break. I will also listen for the same four keys inside key up event. So we have this dot keys array here. In key down, if arrow down, up, left or right is pressed and that key is not yet present in this dot keys array, we push it into the array. In key up, when any of these four arrows are released, we find index of that key inside this dot keys array and we use splice method to remove it. 
This .keys array now holds information about which arrow keys are currently pressed down. Sometimes it can be multiple ones at the same time. I remove these console logs by instantiating input handler class here on line 50, all the code inside constructor on line 8 will be executed. We have this.keys property as an empty array and we use key down and key up event listeners to add and remove specific keyboard inputs from that array. And now we know how to handle keyboard inputs in a game. We will use them to move player around in the next part. Player class will define properties of player object. It will draw it animate it and update its position based on user input. Player object needs to be aware of game boundaries. We don't want it to run off screen, so I pass it game width and game height as arguments and I convert them into class properties like this. I'm using sprite sheet of specific size. Here we have frames of width and height of 200 pixels. It's a good practice to size your sprite sheets to the actual size you will use in your game. I can also resize them with code, but it's cleaner to have art assets of the right size. This.x will be 0 and this.y will be 0 at first. Player object will have public draw method. It will expect context as an argument to specify which canvas we want to draw on, in case we want multiple layers and multiple canvases in our game. I will start by calling built-in fill rectangle method to draw a rectangle to represent our player. I pass it x, y, width and height. Since I have black background, I set fill style to white so that we can see the rectangle. On line 62, I create an instance of player class using the new keyword. Here on line 31, I can see player class constructor expects game width and game height as arguments, so I pass it canvas width from line 4 and canvas height from line 5. I get an error, game width is not defined. It's because I made a typo here on line 32. Now it works and I can display our player by calling its public draw method we just wrote. It expects context as an argument, so I pass it ctx from line 3. I can move player around by adjusting its x and y coordinates. Let's make it stand on the bottom of game area, so this.gameHeight minus this.height. We will also need update method to move player around. Let's start by increasing player's horizontal x coordinate by 1 for every call of update method. If I call update method just like this, there won't be any visible movement. I put it inside animation loop and I use request animation frame built in method to make it loop. I pass it animate the name of its parent function to create endless animation loop and I call animate like this to start it. I also need to put draw inside. I delete this. We can see trail behind player rectangle. I want to only see the current animation frame. To delete old paint from canvas I use built-in clear rectangle method. It will delete entire canvas between each animation loop. Perfect, now we have player moving from left to right as we defined in its update method. Instead of drawing a white rectangle, let's draw player image. I call built-in draw image method. I need to bring player sprite sheet into the project, so this.image property is a document dot get element by ID and I give it ID of player image. I pass this.image from line 38 to draw method and I pass it x and y of 0, 0, so top left corner of canvas. It will just draw the entire sprite sheet at these coordinates. I pass it this.x and this.y instead. You can see it just draws the entire large sprite sheet with all the frames. Draw image method can accept optional fourth and fifth arguments for width and height. It will then stretch or shrink the image to fill all available area. Like this. I actually just want to draw one frame, so I pass it another four optional arguments. Source x, source y, source width and source height. This defined rectangle we want to crop out from the source sprite sheet and destination x, destination y, destination width and destination height define where on destination canvas we want to place that cropped out rectangle onto. I pass it 0, 0 as source x, source y and we are cropping to this dot width, this dot height, so this area. Now we can see top left frame in the sprite sheet. I can use source x and source y to jump around the sprite sheet. By changing value of source y, we can jump between different rows. 
By changing the value we pass as source x, we are navigating within the sprite sheet horizontally. Let's just turn these values into class properties, called for example frame x and frame y. I replace them here and now we can navigate around sprite sheet by changing values of these properties. Perfect. I comment this line out. The movement will work this way. We will have this dot speed property. Initially I set it to zero. We will be adding this dot speed to this dot x at all times. When it's zero, there will be no movement. When this dot speed is a positive number, player will move to the right. When it's a negative number, player will move to the left on the negative direction on horizontal x axis. Now we can connect keyboard inputs to player movement. Update method will expect input as an argument. I take input from line 69 and I pass it to player update method here. We are interested in this dot keys property from line 9, which holds all currently active keys. We can access that property from input argument we are receiving here. So this section will deal with horizontal movement. If input dot keys contains arrow up, so if index of arrow up is more than minus one, run the following code. Actually, let's start with arrow right and set this dot speed from line 41 to five. When arrow right is found in this array from line 9, set player speed to 5. It will make player to move to the right. But there is nothing to set speed back to 0, so it never stops moving. I create an else statement here and inside I set player speed back to 0. Now player moves to the right only when I hold down right arrow key. Nice! I do else if statement here, be careful about the brackets. It's easy to get it wrong and get an error here. Else if arrow left is pressed, set player speed to minus 5. Now I can move player left and right. Player can easily move off screen if we hold the arrow for too long. Let's introduce some horizontal boundaries. If horizontal x coordinate is less than 0, set it back to 0. Now we can't move past the left edge of game area. Else if player's horizontal coordinate is more than game width minus player's width, meaning right edge of player rectangle is touching the right edge of canvas area, also don't allow it to move past this point. Perfect. Jumping is a bit more complicated, but it's not that hard. I say if arrow up key was pressed, set velocity y property to minus 30. I set velocity y property on player object and initially I set it to zero. Let's just move this around so that I have controls in one place horizontal movement separate and I create a section for vertical movement. Actually this line also belongs under horizontal movement, here. At all times I will be adding velocity y property from line 42 to player's vertical coordinate from line 37. Initially velocity y is set to zero so we will get no vertical movement. When I press up arrow key velocity y is set to minus 30 and player just flies off screen. I need a force that will push in the opposite direction. I can call it gravity or maybe weight. I set it to zero at first. I need a check to see if player is in the air or standing on ground. I will need that check in multiple places, so I might as well make it into a utility method like this. I call it for example on ground and it will return true or false based on how this statement evaluates. If this dot y is more or equal to game height minus player height, we know player is standing on solid ground. Here in vertical movement section I say if on ground is false, meaning if player is currently in the air, take velocity y and start gradually increasing it by this dot weight from line 43. I set this dot weight to 1, we jump and eventually player falls back down. Size of the jump depends on how long you hold up arrow key. We don't want it to work like that, let's fix it. When we press up arrow key, I set velocity y to minus 10 so we can see it better. I create an else statement here and inside we set velocity y back to zero. So if player is in the air, gradually add more and more weight to velocity y. Else if player is back on ground, reset velocity y back to zero to stop vertical movement. If I jump too high, player partially falls through the floor before velocity y is reset back to zero. To prevent this from happening, let's introduce a vertical boundary on the ground level. If player's y coordinate is more than game height minus player's height, I set it to game height minus player's height. Player can never be below this point. That works. 
The height of jump is still dependent on how long I hold up arrow key, because each tick adds another minus 10 to velocity y. Also, if I press up arrow over and over, player will keep jumping higher and higher. We only want player to be able to jump when it's standing on solid ground. Here on line 55, I say if up arrow is pressed and if player is on ground, only then decrease velocity y by minus 10. Now we can't double jump anymore. Let's do minus 30 for a bigger jump. Maybe minus 32. So jumping works like this. Velocity y is zero. When we press up arrow key, velocity is immediately set to minus 32. This statement on line 66 becomes true and weight of one is being added over and over to velocity y. That will make velocity y go from minus 32 to zero and then back to positive numbers so player will go up, it will gradually slow down, stop, and it will start falling back down again as the value of velocity y goes from negative into positive numbers. When we hit the floor again, line 69 will set velocity back to zero and the jump is complete. When we jump, we want to animate a different row of sprite sheet. I want this jumping animation, so I set this.frame y to one. When we land back on ground, I set frame y to zero. Endlessly scrolling backgrounds are very easy to implement. I made a special episode about different techniques I like to use and how to split it into individual layers for parallax effect. Today we will just do a single endlessly scrolling layer. Constructor will expect game width and game height and I convert these arguments into class properties. This.image will be my background image. I gave it an ID of background image spelled like this. This.x will be zero. This.y will be zero. I check my image and I can see its width is 2400 pixels. Height is 720 pixels. Draw method will take context as an argument to specify which canvas we want to draw on. I call built in draw image method and I want to draw this.image from line 84. I pass it x and y. On line 109, I instantiate my background class by calling the new keyword. I pass it game dimensions, so canvas width and canvas height. Inside animation loop, I call background.draw. Draw method from line 90 and I pass it ctx as an argument. We are drawing everything on a single canvas element, so I need to draw background first before I draw the player, so that the player is visible. Now I want to make the background animate to the left. First I pass it width and height here, even though I didn't have to do it since my art assets are already correct final sizes. There is no need for resizing them with code. Custom update method. I create a property I call speed and I set it to 20. Horizontal coordinate of the background will be minus equals 20 pixels per frame. This will make it scroll to the left. Inside animation loop I call background update and it just scrolls off screen. In update method, I create a reset check. I say if this.x is less than zero, minus this.width from line 87, meaning if background scrolled all the way off screen, set its horizontal exposition back to zero. To create an illusion of endlessly scrolling background, we need to use a trick here. I will be drawing the same image twice. I will position the second image to the right next to the first one by setting its horizontal x coordinate to this.x plus this.width. Now it looks like it's just one single endless seamless image. If I put a gap of 50 pixels, you will see where the first image ends and the second image starts. I remove the gap. We never actually see the full size of the second image. They are both scrolling at the same speed and when we get to this point, the image on the right just fills the gap before the first image can reset and start scrolling again. This happens very fast, so it creates an illusion of endlessly scrolling seamless image. I go much deeper on this topic in a special episode. For now, this is all we need to know here. Sometimes you can still see a small gap where the first image ends and the second one begins. You can easily fix it by accounting for scrolling speed when setting horizontal position of the second image. I will comment out line 120 for now, so the movement doesn't distract us. You can do the same or keep it going, it's up to you. In our game, player needs to avoid dangerous enemies by jumping over them. 
enemy class will serve as a blueprint to create a single enemy object. Constructor will expect game width and game height as arguments, because enemies need to be aware of game area boundaries. I check my sprite sheet and width of single frame is 160 pixels, height is 119 pixels. This dot image will point towards image element with an ID of enemy image. Draw method will expect context as an argument. We call built-in draw image method. I pass it this dot image from line 107. I will also need this dot x and this dot y properties on my enemy. I pass them to draw method here. I create an instance of enemy class using the new keyword. I pass it canvas width and canvas height. I call enemy1 draw from inside animation loop and I pass it CDX. Now we can see what we are doing, so back inside draw image method on enemy class. I pass it width and height. I also need to pass it source x, source y, source width and source height like we did with player, because we want to crop out single frame from the sprite sheet. Source x will be number 0 times this.width. Source y could be 0 times this.height, but since this sprite sheet has only one row, there will be no vertical navigation, so source y value can stay hardcoded to 0. I create frame x for horizontal navigation in sprite sheet and I replace it here inside the draw image method. Vertical coordinate of the enemy will be game height minus height of the enemy. And horizontal position is game width, so that it's hidden just behind the right edge of canvas. I create an update method and inside we will just decrease x by 1 per frame to make enemy move to the left. I call enemy1 update from inside animation loop and we are animating one enemy created with our enemy class. I don't want to just have one enemy, I want to have multiple active enemies on the screen at the same time. Up here on line 6 I create a let variable I call for example enemies and I set it to an empty array. I delete these two lines of code from inside animation loop. We will draw and update our enemies from inside handle enemies function on line 121. Handle enemies function will also be periodically adding new enemies to the game. So I take enemies array from line 6 and I call push on it. We will push instance of enemy class so new enemy like this. I know I have to pass it game width and game height so I pass it canvas width and canvas height here. Then I want to call draw method and update method from line 116 for each enemy object in the array, so enemies for each. I call individual object in that array for example enemy and I use arrow function syntax here. For each enemy object inside enemies array call their draw method. I pass it ctx and also call their update method. I will be calling handle enemies function for every animation frame so I can't just leave this line of code here like this. I don't want to push 60 enemies per second into our game. I take this line outside temporarily so it will just run once on the initial page load. So it will add just one enemy to the array at first. I call handle enemies from inside animation loop here on line 143. Perfect. Everything still works. Let's say I want to add new enemy into the array every 2 seconds. How do I do that? We can use timestamps and delta time. I create a helper variable called last time which will hold the value of timestamp from the previous animation frame. Inside animation loop I create a constant called delta time. Delta time is the difference in milliseconds between timestamp from this loop and timestamp from the previous loop. The value of delta time tells us how many milliseconds our computer needs to serve one animation frame. Usually if we are running at 60 frames per second, delta time is around 16 milliseconds. So delta time is timestamp from this loop minus timestamp from the previous loop. This timestamp value is auto-generated here. Request animation frame has a special feature. It automatically generates a timestamp and passes it as an argument to the function it calls. So because animate is being called over and over by request animation frame here, it receives timestamp values as argument each time it's called. The first initial call of animate here on line 149 doesn't have auto-generated timestamp because it's not being called by request animation frame, so I have to pass it something here. I pass it 0. When I calculated delta time, difference in milliseconds between timestamp from this loop and timestamp from the previous loop, I set last time to timestamp so that it can be used in the next loop 
as the value for timestamp from the previous loop. Our animation loop is created by request animation frame. It automatically adjusts the screen refresh rate, so most screens will run at 60 frames per second, which means if I console log delta time, I should get 1000 milliseconds divided by 60 frames per second. My delta time should be around 16.6 milliseconds. If you get a different number here, let me know. I wonder if we all get the same value. Now that we have delta time, we can use it to time different things around our code base. We will use it to trigger periodic events. I pass delta time to handle enemies. I comment this out. I make sure handle enemies expects delta time value. To time something periodically with delta time, I need two helper variables. Enemy timer, which will be counting milliseconds from zero to a certain limit. And every time it reaches that limit, it will trigger something and reset itself back to zero. We will need enemy interval, which will be a value in milliseconds for that time limit. I want to add new enemy in the game every thousand milliseconds. Every time timer reaches 1000. In handle enemies, I say if enemy timer from line 140 is more than enemy interval from line 141, push new enemy into enemies array. Then reset enemy timer back to zero, so we can count again. Else, just keep adding delta time to our enemy timer until the limit defined in enemy interval is reached. Using delta time like this will make sure our events are timed the same on slow and fast computers because faster computer will have lower delta time, so it will take more loops to accumulate enough in its timer. That way, fast and slow computer will reach the limit at the same time. I explain this in more detail in a special class. I can also set enemy interval to 2000 milliseconds, 2 seconds. I create this.speed property on enemy class. I could give each enemy randomized speed here using math.random. I will give all of them the same speed of 8 and here I say this.x minus equals this.speed. You can see enemies come in a set interval of 2 seconds, very predictable. Maybe I want to randomize that interval a little bit. I can for example create a variable called a random enemy interval and I set it to a random number between 500 and 1500 milliseconds. I change enemy interval to 1000. Whenever enemy timer reaches enemy interval plus random enemy interval, I push new enemy and I set random enemy interval from line 147 to a different value. I could have also randomly set some enemies further along x-axis to get the same result. Now enemies are coming in more random, less predictable intervals. Inside the draw method on player class, I can remove the white rectangle behind player. I pause the background again by commenting out line 154. We are displaying just the first frame in player and enemy sprite sheets. Let's actually animate those sprite frames. The sprite sheets we are using are optimized for speed between 15 to 20 frames per second, so I would like to be able to set FPS frames per second for sprite frame animation while still allowing the rest of our game, things like player position and background scrolling, to update 60 times per second. How do we do it? With delta time. I'm passing delta time to handle enemies here on line 157. I pass it along to enemy update method and I make sure update method on enemy class expects that value. Update method is being called from inside animate 60 times per second. Inside update method here I will use the delta time to keep track of how many milliseconds passed between individual calls and only when the right threshold is reached I will swap frames in the sprite sheet. To animate sprite sheets horizontally I will cycle between frame x of 0 and max frame, which in case of enemy sprite sheet is 5. To time frame rate with delta time, I will need three helper properties. This.fps to set frames per second. Let's do 20. Keep in mind this FPS will affect horizontal navigation within enemy sprite sheet. How fast we swap between individual animation frames. Nothing else will be affected. I want the rest of the game to run at 60 frames per second. I could use this technique to slow the entire game down to 20 frames per second, but then Player controls wouldn't feel very responsive, we would get delays in collision detection, displayed text and so on. I want to slow down only animation of enemy sprite sheet, nothing else. I will also need frame timer, which will count from 0 to frame interval over and over. And frame interval will define that value we are counting towards. 
it's a value of how many milliseconds each frame lasts, so 1000 milliseconds divided by 20 frames per second in this case. First, let's cycle between frames at full speed, so if this dot frame x from line 111 is more than max frame, set frame x back to zero, else increase frame x by one. I have to do more or equal here so we don't get empty frame. Because of this source x attribute, we are passing to draw image method on line 119, cycling between zero and five with frame x variable will animate sprite sheet horizontally. Now you can see enemy sprite sheet is animating, but it's very fast. These particular sprite sheets were designed for a lower frame rate. We defined FPS of 20 on line 113. Here I say if this dot frame timer from line 114 is more than frame interval from line 115, only then run this code that manages frame x cycles. At the same time, reset frame timer back to zero so it can count again. Else, just keep adding delta time to frame timer until the threshold of milliseconds defined in frame interval is reached. Now you can see enemy sprite sheet is swapping between frames slower at 20 frames per second, while enemy movement is still at original 60 frames per second. Inside update method on player class, I will do exactly the same thing. First, I say if frame x from line 40 is more than max frame, which I need to define here, we will start with this row and there we have 8 horizontal frames, counting from 0. If frame x is more or equal to max frame, set frame x back to 0, else increase frame x by 1. Running animation on player is animating. I go down here to enemy class and I copy FPS, frame timer and frame interval properties and I paste them here on our player class. Inside update method here, we are dealing with sprite animation. Here are controls. Yes, so if frame timer from line 44 is more than frame interval, run all this sprite animation code and reset frame timer back to zero. Else, keep increasing frame timer by delta time. Update method doesn't have access to delta time, so I make sure it takes it as an argument when we call it here on line 181. Up here, I make sure update method expects that argument. Now, player sprite sheet is animating at 20 frames per second. When I jump, we get blinking because max frame is set to 8 on line 41 and jump row doesn't have that many frames, so we are including empty frames. We have only two player states basically, jumping and running on ground, so dealing with that is easy. Down here we deal with vertical movement. When we are not on ground, we set max frame to 5 for jumping animation. Else, meaning we are on ground, set max frame to 8 for running animation. On line 151 we are adding new enemy to our game in a randomized interval. When I console lock enemies array, I can see it's endlessly growing and adding more and more enemies. I actually want to remove enemies that moved off screen from enemies array. On enemy class, I create a property I call marked for deletion and I initially set it to false. In update method, I say if horizontal x coordinate on enemy is less than zero minus enemy width, meaning if it has moved past the left edge of game area, set marked for deletion to true. Inside handle enemies I say take enemies array, which we defined earlier as a let variable, and reassign it to the same array, but filter that array first and only include elements that have marked for deletion property set to false. Filter is a built-in array method which creates a new array with all elements that pass the test implemented by the provided function. In our case, all our elements are tested and checked if their marked for deletion property is false. Now you can see in console we have between one and two enemies in the array at any given time. All the enemies are being removed. I want to display score. On line 7, I define a let variable called score and I initially set it to zero. On line 168, we have display status text function. I will use it to display current score. I pass it context as an argument to specify which canvas we want to draw on. I set fill style to black color. I set canvas font to 40 pixels Helvetica. Fill text built in canvas method will actually draw the text. It expects text we want to draw and x and y where to draw it. 
I want the text to say score colon space plus value of score variable from line 7, x coordinate 20, y coordinate 50. I call this new function from inside animation loop and I pass it ctx. Inside update method on enemy class, I will count score every time enemy moves off screen, assuming player successfully avoided colliding with that enemy. And I increment score by 1. That works, nice. I want to highlight the font. I can give it canvas shadow, but for some reason in Firefox, built-in canvas shadow property causes lag and frame rate drops, so I will do a trick here. I will draw the same message twice, one black, one white, the top one will have two pixels offset, so I kinda created my own shadow manually. Let's check for collisions between player and enemies. First we need to decide on the right technique to use here. The easiest ones are collision between rectangles and collision between circles, where we give elements like player and enemy hitboxes, shaped as rectangles or circles. We could also do more complex and more precise collision checks here, such as collision check between polygons, called separating axis theorem, or we can base collisions on color or opacity. I will stroke rectangle around our enemies so we can see basic collision hitbox. Let's make it white. I do the same for player. You can see the rectangles now. If I use collision detection between rectangles and I keep those hitboxes at their base sizes, whenever these two rectangles touch or intersect, we will get collision between player and enemy. I tried to apply it before and I played with it and sometimes we get really unfortunate collisions, like on this screenshot where my player is landing from a jump. Dog and worm images are clearly far away from each other, but you can see that the corners intersect and we got game over. I asked you in my community tab how you would approach this challenge. We spoke about different options we have here. Some of you suggested separating axis theorem for a collision between polygons. Some of you think that we could use a set of smaller rectangles that match shapes of player and enemy sprites more closely than one larger shape. Some of you think that simple collision detection between circles would be enough in this scenario. Let's try to draw circular hitboxes around our objects to see what it would look like. It's also easy to offset these circles by a specific pixel value horizontally or vertically in relation to player and enemy object. We can also make them smaller or larger if needed. I agree with you and I think that using circular collision detection for jumping game like this will get rid of accidental collisions where two corners of rectangles collide. Now I need to decide where in our codebase we will run collision checks. I know I need to check position of player against position of all active enemies for each animation frame, so I might as well do it inside player update method. I pass it enemies array as an argument. It contains all currently active enemy objects. On line 59, inside update method on player class, I make sure update method expects that argument. We will calculate collision detection here. We need to run it against every enemy object in enemies array, so enemies we passed as an argument for each, and then I do collision detection calculation between player circle hitbox and enemy circle hitbox. To do that we need to calculate the distance between the center points of these two circles and we compare that distance with the radius of circle 1 and radius of circle 2. If the distance is less than these two radii added together, we know we have a collision. To get distance between two points, two center points, we use Pythagoras theorem formula. We have a center point of player circle and center point of enemy circle. We calculate distance on horizontal x-axis, dx. We calculate distance on vertical y-axis, dy. It gives us imaginary right triangle and we know hypotenuse of this triangle is the distance between these two points. We calculate it as square root of dx squared plus dy squared. If distance between center point of player circle and center point of enemy circle is less than radius of enemy circle plus radius of player circle, we have collision and we set game over to true. Up on line 8 I create a led variable called game over and I set it to false at first. I want the game to pause when game over is true, so inside animation loop I say only run request animation frame and continue animating our game if game over is false. You can see that when collision is detected, game stops. Perfect. I also want to display game over message, so inside the display status text function I say if game over is true, set text align to center, fill style to black, 
fill text, game over, try again, and coordinates canvas width divided by 2 and 50, 200. Make a copy again, set fill style to white and offset the second line by 2 pixels. I need to fix our collision detection. We are using enemy X and enemy Y coordinates as center points of collision circle, which means collision area on each enemy is this blue circle. And same with the player. Since player X and player Y is the top left corner of rectangle area from which player image is drawn, I can't set it as center point of collision circle. Because I did do that, we are not checking for collisions between white circles. We are actually checking for collisions between the blue circles I just drew. The fix is simple. Dx, distance on the horizontal x-axis between two center points needs to be offset by half of enemy width and half of player width to move these center points from top left corner to the middle of rectangular area. Same goes for vertical dy check. Brackets are very important here. Now after this fix, collisions are correctly being detected between white circle areas around player and enemies. I can offset these circles by a specific amount to move them around. I can make them smaller or larger. We will expand on this in the next episode. We will also give parallax layers to the background. We will add multiple crawling and flying enemy types. We will give player a special skill and many more states than just running and jumping. Player will be able to sit down to stop the game from scrolling and while sitting it will also regenerate energy for special moves. We will have more robust scoring system and player will be able to generate energy by defeating enemies which will allow it to stay in power up mode longer. I will show you how to give player multiple lives so we don't get game over after just one collision and we will cover many other game development techniques that will be useful for all your future projects. Full series with all episodes that led up to this is linked in the video description. Each episode is a standalone project that teaches you important element we will use in the next episode to make the final game. Hope you had fun today. If you finished this tutorial, let me know in the comments. You can just say I did it. Also, let's discuss what other features, special skills, superpowers and fun elements you would like to implement in a game like this. I will see you in the next episode. Well done for completing this. This is a big achievement, especially if you are a beginner. Click like, please.